So let's go to the erectile dysfunction talk. So what is erectile dysfunction? Uh, there's been varying definitions in the past, and I think this most simplistic is the ability to maintain erection firm enough to have sexual intercourse. Uh, how common is it? One in two men over age 40, so that's 50%. Over 30 million American men, and 90% is physical, and 10% is psychological, uh, which is underestimated. Uh, a lot of the wives are here. So that's good for them to know. Um, <clears throat> so physical causes of erectile dysfunction. Uh, I think uh, right now what we're seeing is an identifier, erectile dysfunction, for significant uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and urologists now are being placed at the forefront because a lot of men tend to never miss their urologist appointment, but uh, seem to somehow miss their internal medicine or primary care appointments. So we're identifying these, these patients because they're at risk of possibility for diabetes, heart disease, uh, depends what medications they're taking. Surgery, particularly, uh, you know, in this uh, room today, you know, prostate, uh, prostate cancer, uh, undergoing whatever surgical procedures, but radiation, anything along those lines. Uh, spinal injury and hormonal imbalances are also causes. Uh, so heart disease, diabetes, and erectile dysfunction, we're starting to know now. There's large trials, uh, particularly uh, I myself uh, is involved with the SEER Medicare registry. Uh, not looking specifically at this, but I'm looking at uh, prostate cancer patients, hormonal therapies, and seeing how this affects the patient. Because my job is to ensure the overall survival and prostate cancer specific survival. What we're noticing specifically with erectile dysfunction is uh, diabetes associated with peripheral vascular disease, which may be a cause of erectile dysfunction, and vice versa. Uh, causes of erect, uh, erectile dysfunction, complication of prostate surgery, uh, which we all um, you know, can appreciate. Uh, the one thing I think that's underappreciated, and I just did a, a recent study uh, on the trends of radical prostatectomy, is there's a decreased risk of, uh, of complications uh, I specifically looked at a large registry of uh, about 30,000 patients, um, but from 2003 to 2006, and with the separation of the different codes, i.e. patients who underwent minimally invasive surgery and those that went open, with the newer technology available and my personal assessment as well when I'm in the operating theater is uh, the unprecedented visualization you know, of the nerves, the neurovascular bundle, and preserving that to decrease the risk of erectile dysfunction. Uh, however, blood vessel disease, uh, the other underlying etiologies, um, you know, I can't control, you know, with the robotic instruments such as atherosclerosis, uh, CHF, and pelvic trauma. Uh, so everyone knows it affects the overall quality of life. Uh, this is just a, a beautiful diagram illustrating that. Uh, the physiology of the erection, it's both a passive and an active process. Uh, the passive process is uh, the relaxation of the uh, smooth muscle itself. Uh, and uh, basically the filling of the blood to the penis, uh, which causes the erection. Uh, and then with the contraction, then it, it, there's called detumescence or, or decrease in the erection. So do I have to live with erectile dysfunction? And the answer is no. Uh, and nearly every man can be uh, successfully treated one way or another, and there's different treatments. The first thing, and uh, I always uh, t tend to uh, you know, listed this when I'm doing the history and physical, paying attention to the lifestyle and things of this nature, eliminating smoking, alcohol intake, you know, diet, exercise, everything that your primary care physician has been telling you for years. Uh, the urologists now are, are being at that forefront of recommending that as well. Treatment options, and I relisted this, uh, you know, to how I think the least invasive depends upon, of course, you know, how the patient is, what other comorbidities they have, but um, oral medications, everyone knows Viagra, uh, which has the longest, uh, you know, uh, series and studies, Levitra, Cialis, um, those are the PD5 inhibitors. Um, the one thing, though, is it can drop your blood pressure, it depends, you know, what, uh, you know, underlying heart diseases uh, one has. Um, the is urethral suppositories, and basically it's a capsule you insert into the penis, and uh, it causes, it can cause a uh, penile pain, but also, oddly enough as well, is it can cause a decrease in blood pressure. So the time that we usually do this is in the office to see, you know, how the patient responds and hopefully, you know, they don't uh, uh, drop their blood pressure too low. Uh, vacuum erection devices are something that I kind of put in between the, the suppositories and uh, before discussing injection therapy because I think the injection therapy tends to be the more invasive uh, of procedures, not to belittle the urethral suppositories. 
Um, and then finally, penile implants. So oral therapies, uh, it works in response to sexual stimulation. Uh, and the uh, different pills uh, have different varying uh, durations of activities. Uh, Viagra and Levitra tend to be on a similar half-life level, um, whereas Cialis, now they came up with a new formulation where you could take an everyday Cialis pill, uh, the five milligram, uh, but they're, the traditional one has the longest um, uh, duration or half-life, if you will, up to 36 hours. And that's not the erection, it's just in your bloodstream. So. That would be a problem. So uh, vacuum erection devices, um, these aren't, uh, you know, it just seems a little cumbersome. Uh, patients don't tend to like it as much just because of uh, having to place a vacuum there, the constriction device. It's not natural. I think that's the bottom line. Uh, but I think it's an excellent alter uh, you know, alternative to any other form of treatments, medications, things of this nature if you're the correct patient uh, and have other issues at hand. Um, this is the suppository device. This is. Uh, doesn't sell this uh, all that well, um, but basically you insert the pill into the urethra, it dissolves in the urethra, and hopefully there's a response to the, uh, for an erection itself. Problem with this, and obviously depicted by this picture, uh, is the penile pain that can be associated with this. Um, also to inserting something into your penis directly in the urethra isn't the most appealing as well. And it needs to be done the first time in the office, so if any of you decide to try this, Make sure your urologist, after they prescribe it to you, you don't go home and do this. You have to come back to the office because, like I said before, that drop in blood pressure, that's imperative. Um, and sometimes, I don't know if all urologists are doing this or physicians that are prescribing it. What's but make sure you don't do it on your own. What's the, at the round thing? Uh, that's the inserter. So it inserts the capsule through there. So it's kind of a little bit of a pressure reservoir. Doesn't look like fun. No. <laughs> yes. No. Well, neither is this. So uh, injection therapy is the other uh, therapy that uh, we're able to provide uh, patients. There's different combinations, formulations, bimix, trimix, which use different agents, varying agents to basically stimulate uh, that vasculature to dilate, allow the blood flow to go in. Uh, patients tend to have uh, pretty impressive responses. Uh, I like to uh, have the patients come into the office and obviously show them for the first time, unless they have, so I have some prior experiences. Um, the, the most important th the side effect is you know, pain on the administration, inserting, but now we have these hypodermic needles. So I, I think from, I mean I haven't done it to myself, but I imagine <laughs> that uh, you know, the patients that do come in, it's uh, a little less painful. Um, and uh, the duration though uh, can, can vary, specifically if someone's starting it for the first time. I go on the lowest dose possible. And the men aren't too excited about that. They want to have you know, the, the full erection that they had beforehand. But uh, the last thing I want is to have a prolonged erection, um, and uh, that could be a problem where you have to go to the emergency room and things of this nature. The one thing, obviously, repeat injections in the penis, how often you're doing it, is a risk of scarring. Um, and it's not scarring at the site of the injection sites, but it's the uh, stimulation, if you will, of the blood vessels themselves. There's been studies to show that there's uh, increased scarring, and, uh, and patients need a little bit more and more and more, or varying, uh, uh, varying uh, degrees of uh, um, uh, frequencies of, of the injections to get the same response. Uh, this is basically just an example. Yes, it looks painful, but uh, the good thing is, is injecting it into one corpora, that's one of the chambers, uh, the way the, uh, the anatomy works out, it gets disseminated to both chambers, so you get uh, an erection uh, via the, those means. So uh, the response, now we'll talk about uh, penile implants, it has the highest response rate and overall satisfaction at 93%. Um, oddly enough, uh, you know, the penile injection therapy uh, doesn't have as a superior response as the oral medications. Um, so penile implants, so I think this is, uh, in my mind, an underutilized uh, technique in the country. It depends also, too, who's doing it, how well they're uh, trained in it. Um, I did over 200 implants you know, during uh, you know, the whole course of my training, but personally myself, probably a, a little over 50, um, you know, uh, but, and that's varying uh, with penile implants, malleables, and things of this nature. So uh, it's been over the market for 30 years. Uh, there's a little over 20,000 per year that are implanted and over 300,000 implants to date. Uh, patient satisfaction rate, like I said before, is quite superior, greater than 90%. Uh, 
Um, the proven benefits, uh, you can achieve an erection easily and maintain it. Uh, the erections are hard enough uh, for penetration and allow you to complete sexual intercourse, which is uh, underestimated and you can't get that same guarantee, if you will, with uh, any of the other medications. Uh, it's, it's dependable, uh, it works every time, uh, but uh, the one thing is, you know, the, uh, the frequency of failure, it's uh, sometimes well up to 10 years, you can uh, have a certain percentage of failure rates, but the good thing is, is um, you know, it can be replaced um, at, you know, at that time, but you get a pretty good um, uh, everlasting, you know, kind of effect with the implant itself. Uh, it requires surgery. All right, and that's something anyone, men don't like having their penises operated upon. So that's something that you know needs to be taken into account. But the patients do quite well uh, from the procedure. Um, there's a lot of pain, some swelling there. Um, you can't activate the device, you know, four to six weeks. So the weight, um, you know, something that uh, needs to be considered. But uh, like I said before, there's a rare case of mechanical failure, which requires vision surgery. And my, my, I've only really seen a lot of these tend to happen, you know, after you know about 10 years or so, uh, the devices have been replaced. Um, where I trained, actually, one of the surgeons at that time uh, would do the radical prostatectomy. He's an aggressive onco oncologic surgeon, so he didn't preserve the nerves, you know, at that time. This was a little bit before the research came into what the nerves were. So he would do the specimen at the same time they put the penile implant. So that doesn't exist anymore there, but um, thought I would just kind of throw that in. It's kind of funny. Uh, so types of implants, there's non-inflatable, there's a two-piece implant, uh, which has just the scrotal implant, and I think that's, uh, or the uh, device to pump the device, and then there's a three-piece, where it has an abdominal reservoir, and then one in the scrotum. Uh, so the non-inflatable implant is easy to use. It's uh, uh, basically you just uh, manipulate it up and down, uh, it's a good option for men with limited dexterity, and it eliminates uh, any uh, reservoir or pumps of that nature. Disadvantages is it's not as natural as uh, one would expect, obviously, but it's, uh, it stays firm when it's not in an erect position. Uh, advantages of a two-piece, uh, it's simple to use in regards to, it's just uh, um, a couple pumps uh, in regards for the scrotal, um, uh, pressing the scrotal reservoir. Uh, there's no abdominal reservoir, and uh, it actually is quite natural um, in, uh, uh, compared to the non-inflatable uh, implants. Disadvantages require some manual dexterity, but like I said before, usually it's about two pumps, uh, two, two to three, and you have uh, pretty good rigidity um, of the device, and patients are quite satisfied. We actually did, um, oddly enough, about half and half in regards for the inflatable prostheses of these and the others. Um, which I'll talk about now. So the three-piece uh, has the same advantages of a two-piece, but there's, uh, in addition, uh, it acts and feels more like a natural erection, uh, expands the girth of the penis, more firm uh, and full than other implants. I think that's uh, the newer devices now. There's one that has adds additional length as well as girth, so that's something that the two-piece cannot offer. Um, and it feels softer and more flaccid when deflated. So. All in all, it's the more natural, um, you know, of all the prostheses. Uh, the disadvantages, uh, you know, require some manual dexterity. There's additional pumping, you know, not just twice, but, uh, you know, obviously it's more than that. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be up to, uh, you know, 8 to 10, a little bit more. Uh, but uh, and the possibility of leakage or malfunction, any additional, you know, machinery, that just uh, that's an inherent variable. And the possibility of unintentional ere erections with additional reservoirs. Uh, so, how does it work? Fluid flows from the reservoir in the abdomen into the cylinders of the penis when the pump is squeezed until there's a firm erection. Uh, once the erection is not needed, you squeeze the pump, which allows fluid to return to the reservoir. Uh, so, uh, there's a high satisfaction rate, as I said before. I think, you know, 96% would say they would undergo the procedure again, uh, which is quite amazing considering everything I described before, particularly the hesitancy being operated on the penis, pain, things of this nature. And 92% would recommend the device to others. So, summary, uh, there's just different options to treat erectile dysfunction. Uh, nearly every man, every man can be successfully uh, treated. Uh, penile implants are dependable and a long-term solution. Um, but I think you know the most important uh, thing of this nature, as well as from the prior uh, discussion, 
is talking to a urologist that is experienced and I think has a wide array of knowledge with erectile dysfunction to give you the varying treatment options that are available.